All right, let's get started for today. A couple of announcements. Um, your Project Zero, the Python tutorial, well, or refresher might be more accurate, is due tomorrow, 5 p.m. The office hours for that are now posted on Piazza and also on this slide. It's tonight, 8 to 9.30, and tomorrow, noon to 1.30. There's a math self-diagnostic, take that soon. You're not gonna realize you're missing out on the right background until it's too late and we're halfway through the semester, so check this out now. Sections will start next week. There will be an announcement about that on Piazza, um, where you'll get to mark which section you plan to go to. You can go to whichever one you like, but at least you'll know how many people are likely to show up to the one that you are also planning to go to. So watch Piazza for that. Instructional accounts available via our welcome post on Piazza. There are some pinned posts on Piazza for office hours, for lecture videos, for lecture slides, if you want to be notified when a lecture video is up, when lecture slides have been posted and so forth, you can follow those pinned posts and then you'll get an email notification. So let's say you want to print out the slides, you follow that post that has the lecture slides in it, you'll get a notification when that post is being updated. Okay, maybe the most exciting news, medium exciting news, um, exam, midterm timing. Um, a lot of people did not get very excited about a Friday before uh, spring break. Um, so here's the deal. Um, the department has submitted a request to campus to have our midterm on Tuesday evening. This is the week before spring break. Every past year, campus has always fulfilled that request. So it's extremely likely the midterm will be the evening of March 15th. But Campus doesn't guarantee that they uh, satisfy our request, so there's a very small chance that it would be the Wednesday evening instead of the Tuesday evening, but that's where things stand right now. Um, very high chance, extremely high chance, Tuesday evening. And the final is as advertised by campus, 8 to 11 on Thursday morning. Any, oh, another thing is the wait list. So we went from 500 students in the class to 650 students in the class on Tuesday or Wednesday. Still about 100 people on the wait list. So if you know you're gonna drop the class, drop it sooner rather than later, then people from the wait list are able to move in rather than worry about whether they're gonna make it in or not. Um, any questions about logistics? Yes? Um, whenever campus gets back to us, we'll know for sure when the midterm is going to be. For now, I can just give you statistical information that is in the past, they've always given the slot we asked. It's just that they never guarantee that they will do so. And that's why we're always re required to submit a backup slot also, which is that Wednesday, and we'll see what they give us. All right, let's get started with our first set of technical materials then. Today we'll look at search. So what is this about? We're going to discuss agents that plan ahead so that somehow use an internal model of how the world functions to think about what would happen if they were to take some actions and then imagine multiple possible scenarios and then pick the scenario that they think will lead to the best outcome. This will go over a few lectures. Today what we'll look at is first how to formalize a real problem into a search problem. Once it's in that standard format, you're essentially done, because then you'll just be able to run a search algorithm on it and that will give you the solution. And then after we know how to formalize these problems, we'll also look at what these search algorithms are. Today we'll look at some algorithms uh, quite a few of you will have seen before. Depth first, search, breadth first search, and uniform cost search. You will notice that we might cover this a little differently from how you've seen it before. We're covering these in a way that we have a unified representation of all search algorithms. 
and that we are still building up to the next lecture seeing the one that we really are working towards. And so you might have seen some slight tweaks to depth first search that we're not covering that can optimize it just a little bit more than the way we cover it. That's fine, and those tweaks you've seen are great tweaks, but we're not trying to teach you the best possible implementation of depth first search. We're trying to build up to where we'll be next lecture where we look at A star search and then beyond. All right, so agents that plan. It's a natural thing maybe to think an agent should think ahead and make plans about how they're gonna act in the world. But if you were to just start coding an AI agent, you say, well, how can I code up an AI agent? It might not be the first thing you would program. The first thing you might program if you just start out might be something called a reflex agent. This is something where you just write a piece of code and you just have a bunch of statements. You say, if I see this in the, current, in the current situation, then go left. If I see that, go right and so forth. And you just have a bunch of hard-coded statements or in some other way obtained that go directly from whatever the current percept is of the agent and maybe a little bit of memory to actions. So a reflex agent, which is just a comparison point that we start from, just considers the current world and directly maps on what's in the current, current world to taking an action without thinking about its consequences. Could a reflex agent be rational? That is, optimize expected utility. Who thinks a reflex agent could be rational? Quite a few people, okay? Well, let's look at an example. Um, here is our first demo for today. Okay, here we are. Pac-Man in a maze, the task is to eat all the dots. What we wrote here is a reflex agent to solve this, try to solve this problem. The reflex agent just moves in the direction of the closest food pellet. So right now there's a tie, it could go either north or east. And then from there, we'll go east because that's closest to the next food pellet and so forth. So let's see what happens when this reflex agent executes. So what we saw here is an example of a reflex agent actually being rational, doing the optimal thing. Because you can think however much you like about trying to solve that problem. Ultimately, the solution will be to go around in a circle and there happens to be a simple reflex agent that also achieves this. And so this is an example of a rational reflex agent. Let's look at another example. Um, demo number two. So what do we have here? A slightly more complicated grid. Again, the task is to eat the food pellets as quickly as possible. And we run the same reflex agent, move in the direction of the nearest by food pellet. Let's see what happens this time. So far, so good. What's happening now? The nearest by pellet is east. Um, it's trying to move east, still trying to move east, continues to try to move east, keeps hitting that wall, doesn't really think about the consequence of its actions and it just keeps moving or trying to move east and it's stuck there and let's take it out of its misery. Um, so reflex agents in general will not be optimal but there are special cases where they could be optimal. So optimality is not defined by whether you are a reflex agent or a planning agent but by the actual behavior that emerges. So what we'll be looking at is planning agents. Those are agents that ask the question, what if I do something, what will happen? So the decisions are now based on hypothesized consequences of actions. This is kind of subtle if you think about Pac-Man, because if you have a reflex a, a, a planning agent living inside your Pac-Man environment, it's actually gonna simulate a game of Pac-Man. That's gonna be the simulated what if and then after it's simulated many of those games, it's going to pick one of the ways it played out as a thing that it really wants to execute. And this is a real world agent, it would now act in the real world, but for you, it'll still be in the Pac-Man environment where it then do the real execution. So there's a thinking what if, and then the best thing gets used, or hopefully the best thing gets used to actually execute. What do you need for this? You need a model of the world. You need to be able to understand, if you take a certain action, what the consequences are going to be. You need some concept of what it means to achieve the goal. So a definition of what 
that is. So typically, it would be a test. It could be a piece of code in the current state. Has the goal been achieved or not? And continues its inch is considering how the world would be after having taken some actions. Some concepts that will come up. Is a planning algorithm optimal? That is, does it find the best solution or not? Is it complete? That means if there is a solution, will it find it or might it not find it even if there is a solution? And then this idea of planning and replanning. So you could make a plan that goes all the way till you reach a goal. That could be a very long plan. Or you could make a short plan that's not really achieving the goal, but maybe some sub goal. And then after you achieve that, plan for the next sub goal and repeat over and over and over. And that can sometimes allow you to make plans for things that take a very long time now, break it up into smaller pieces. So let's take a look at this. Um, here's our demo for that. So let's first look at the replanning agent. So what are we looking at here? This is Pac-Man again in a maze. The task is to eat the food pellets. And now we give it a sub goal of moving to the closest food pellet. But not just it's not just going to be a reflex to move in the direction of the closest food pellet. It's going to make a plan. It's going to figure out which sequence of actions is going to bring it to the closest food pellet. And it's going to execute that sequence of actions. It's going to then, again, check which sequence of actions is going to now bring me to the next closest food pellet, repeat over and over and over. So when we run this, here is what we get. So it clears the board pretty quickly, a score of 907. Now let's take a look at another agent, Mastermind Pac-Man. Mastermind Pac-Man. Mastermind Pac-Man doesn't just plan for the next food pellet. Mastermind plans to clear the entire board. So it thinks ahead about the entire board and tries to find a way to clear it as effectively as possible. Okay, let's see how this plays out. A lot of the action will actually be in the terminal window here. So Mastermind starts thinking, actually doing some pre-calculations before it really starts doing its thinking. Still pre-calculating, it's done now. Now it's doing its search, doing even more search, just checking out different scenarios of how things could play out. This is a hard problem, it's a very big search space. Found its plan and now it just executes the plan it found. It's actually more effective than the previous approach it does the dead end last, so it doesn't have to backtrack from there and spend extra time covering that distance twice. This is what we'll be working towards in this lecture and next lecture. Yes, question. So the pattern is the mastermind is the how do you make this thing execute the one before the working pattern? So the one before this, the way it is set up, it searches for the nearest by a food pellet. And we'll see what these algorithms are later this lecture, but essentially it gets the goal of eating one food pellet. And so it simulates what could happen if it takes actions, finds a sequence of actions that eats one food pellet, executes that, and then again gets the goal of eating one food pellet, and this repeats over and over. So when it's searching to decide what to do, it looks at all possible things, not all, but a lot of things it could do. And in this case, it, whichever sequence of actions is shortest and encounters a food pellet is the one it's going to pick. Now, how it actually does that is the topic of the lecture. So it's just the motivation of what the result is going to be of the kind of things we're going to cover. We haven't covered yet the exact algorithm that achieves it. So if they're equally distant, then it, it's randomly breaking ties, yes. Okay, so let's first start formalizing problems as search problems. So what's a search problem? It consists of a few components. The first thing is a state space. The state space is a bunch of states. Every state corresponds to what the world could be like. 
So here you see a few example states. In this case, seven example states, but the state space will be larger than this, much, much larger than this. These are just seven example states in this particular world for Pac-Man. Then there's a the successor function. The successor function encodes the dynamics of the world. So it encodes for any given state what actions are available to you, what are the consequences of those actions, so what is, if you were to take a certain action, what is the next state going to be, and what is the cost associated with taking that action in that state. So, for example, for this particular first state, there are two actions available, north and east, and then each has their own consequence and each happens to have a cost of one. Okay. Then we need to define or pick a start state and a goal test. The start state is where the agent starts, so where the agent currently is. The goal test could be, are you in this particular state, but it could also be something more general. It could be, have you cleared all the pallets from the board? And it might not matter where Pac-Man is when all pallets have been cleared, so it could be many states that satisfy the goal test. And a solution to a search problem is a sequence of actions, which we'll call a plan, which transforms the start state into a goal state. All right, so when we build a search problem, really what we're doing is we're building models, and the big thing to keep in mind, in general in artificial intelligence, whenever we're building a model, it's never going to be perfect. We just need to make sure that it's good enough to capture what we care about in the world so that we get meaningful results out of it. We also don't want to make it too detailed. If we make it too detailed, it's going to make typically for an intractable uh, search problem that we can't solve because it's too much detail to deal with. So let's look at some examples to get a sense for what this could go like. So the first one is traveling in Romania, where uh, Professor Anka Dragan happens to originate from. Um, <laughs> Anka didn't uh, draw the map, comes from the Russell and Norvig book. Um, so what we see here is a map of Romania, a road network. And the problem we're interested in is, let's assume we're starting over here in a rod, and we want to get to Bucharest. Okay? In the real world, there's a lot of factors at play. Right? What's the world like? It's not just a bunch of nodes and some edges. It's actually there's roads, there's grass, there's trees, there's birds, there's other cars. There's maybe buses, trains, and so forth. And then we abstracted that here in just a graph that has cities and then an edge indicating, in this case, the distance between each pair of cities where we have a connecting road, right? So our state space is the cities. Successor function is for each city. So a state corresponds to city. Successor function has to be the defining for each state what actions available and what the next state is going to be, what the cost is. So in this case, the actions would be any neighboring city that you could go to. And then the cost could be equal to the distance between where you are now and that city. The start state would be where you start, a rod in this case. And then the goal test in this case would be just testing whether you are in Bucharest. So it's a special kind of goal test that checks whether you achieved a very particular state. What's the solution? Well, we could probably look at this and read off a solution, but for now, we'll, we're just looking at how to formulate the search problem. Second half of the lecture, we'll look at algorithms that will provide a solution for us. You can imagine it'll be something that runs roughly like this. Let's look at another example. So I must be a little more precise about some of the terminology here. When we say world state, we talk about everything that's present in the world. So let's say we're faced with a Pac-Man environment and we talk about the world state for that. It includes where each food pallet is, where each power pallet is, where Pac-Man is, where the ghosts are. Anything that can essentially change is part of the state. And then things that are fixed that will never change like walls, you don't make part of the state because they're fixed. Okay. Now, if you thinking about making these into a search problem, you need to start thinking about what is the problem you're trying to solve. You only want to keep those things that are relevant to what you're trying to do. So let's say the problem is pathing, going from one point to another point. Well, what do you keep around for the state? 
only thing you need to keep around for the state is the coordinates of where you're currently at. It doesn't matter where the food pellets are if the problem is to go to a certain set of coordinates. So just x, y location. Then the actions, well, in this case, Pac-Man environment, you can go north, east, south, or west. What's a successor function? It encodes for each of those actions what the consequences are going to be. It updates the location. Don't need to keep track of anything else in your search state. And then the goal test would be, have I achieved the goal state? In this case, x, y coordinates that define the target. Let's look at another problem. It could still be a Pac-Man world, but the goal is different. Eat all the dots. What would the state space be like now? Position there? So position of Pac-Man and all the dots, because if you don't keep track of all the dots here, there's no way to check that you've eaten them all. All right, so you need both in there. One way to encode the position of all the dots is to have a Boolean vector that indicates zero, one, whether a dot is still present or not in a certain location. That's all you need. You can encode it in many ways, but that's really all you need to encode the search state in this kind of scenario. Actions. Same thing as before, you can move in each of the four directions. Successor function now has to encode the new location of Pac-Man as well, whether or not a uh, pellet has been eaten. So an update to that Boolean vector. And then the goal test would be, have all the dots been eaten? So are all these dot bits zero? Location doesn't matter for the goal test. Why do we want to abstract away some things that don't matter? Well, the reason is that the state space otherwise could get very, very big. So let's look at an example. Here, we have a new environment. Um, there's Pac-Man on the left and the ghosts on the right. What's the world state like? Agent positions. 120 possible positions for Pac-Man, this is a 12 by 10 grid. Food count. There are 30 locations where there is food in the beginning. That food could disappear. So that world state would encode whether or not that food is still there. 12 ghost positions that are possible for each one of them. And then the agent could be facing four directions, north, east, south, or west. And the question is, how many world states do we have if that's our world state? Well, how do you count something like this, right? Well, to pick a world state, the first thing you have to pick is an agent position. 120 choices, that's 120 things you can choose from. Next thing you pick is for each food pellet, whether it's there or not. So you have 120 possible positions, then that's 120 possible possibilities, then times two for the first pellet, whether it's there or not, again times two for whether the next pellet is there or not, and so forth. So times two to the 30, then times 12 to the two, because for each ghost you get 12 things to choose from, and then times four for the number of look, um, directions to choose from. So this is a very, very large number that's unwieldy to deal with. You can never enumerate all possible world states in this environment. Okay? Now, if you just care about the pathing problem, can Pac-Man arrive at a certain location? You can abstract away some of these. You wouldn't need to keep track of the ghosts. Ghosts are locked up on the side anyway. You wouldn't need to keep track of the food pellet. And now you're just left with 120 states. So this is just an illustration that Whatever you can abstract away is good, ultimately, because it'll make our algorithms run faster once we have them up and running. Um, what did the problem is eat all the dots? Well, it'd be 120 times 2 to the 30, because we need to also keep track of all the dots. All right, let's take a small quiz here. New problem for you to think about. In this world, we want Pac-Man to eat all the dots while keeping the ghosts scared at all times. So when Pac-Man needs a power pellet, ghosts will get scared. There's a timer for that, how long they stay scared. And then at some point they become unscared again, unless you've eaten a, food pellet by that, uh, a power pellet by that time. And we'll assume that um, Pac-Man and the ghosts, when they encounter each other, um, when the ghosts are scared, that they respawn still scared for the purpose of this exercise, okay? so. I'll give you about a half minute to talk with your neighbors and think about what a good search state 
would look like for this problem. Let's, let's see what we got. Anybody wants to volunteer their solution? Over there. The location of Pac-Man? The location of Pac-Man, all the dots, all the power pellets. And then some sense of a timer um, to check whether things will run out or not. Any other thoughts? Over there. So one thought there is an addition. Let's keep track of the walls. Any other thoughts? Over there. The position of the ghost. That's another thought over there. So maybe the direction the ghosts are headed because definitely they have some kind of momentum and they tend to keep moving the same way in these kind of games. So that could be something interesting to know about. Anything else? That, that's a good question. Do you really need to keep track of where the ghosts are if you keep them scared at all times for the purpose of eating all the food pellets here, right? All right, so let's, let's recap what we have here. My solution on the slides matches our first solution over there, which is agent position, booleans for each dot, booleans for each power pellet, and a timer for how long the ghost will remain scared. Okay, so there are a few other suggestions. One of them was keep, keep track of where the walls are. That's actually really important. You can't run search without knowing where the walls are. But turns out we don't put that in our state. That's sitting inside the successor function. So the successor function in it has access to where the walls are, but the walls never change, so we don't encode that as part of the state. Where the ghosts are, since our task is to keep the ghosts scared at all times, actually it's not going to matter where they are. And so we can abstract that away. The direction the ghosts are headed, similarly because we don't need to interact with the ghosts in this case, all we need to know is that the timer hasn't run out yet for keeping them scared. In this particular case, we don't need to keep track of that. How we define a different scenario, maybe we would have had to keep track of that. But in this scenario, we can not keep track of that and have a smaller state space. Question over there? Yeah, so that's a good question. So. Typically when you eat a ghost, it'll respawn in its home base and not be scared anymore. For the purpose of this question, we're assuming that they stay scared even when you encounter them. So a slight tweak to the, to the rules to make this question work out more nicely. Question there. Okay, so you can encode whether the pellets are present or not in a variety of ways. The most compact way is just to have booleans that are zeros, ones, depending on whether the pellet is still there or not. And because the locations are fixed, the pellets don't move around, that's a separate thing that never changes. So you, anything that never changes, you can assume you have access to outside of the state, just like the walls. So the coordinates for the pellets and the walls are things that are sitting outside 
of your state because they never change. The successor function would have access to that and would need that to be able to update which, which Boolean goes from zero, 1 to 0 when you visit a certain location. So it's all there in the search problem, just not in the state. All right, so we looked at a few examples of search problems. Let's start looking at how we can solve them. So we've looked at state-space graphs, right? So state-space graph is a mathematical representation of a search problem. Nodes are abstracted world configurations, and arcs will represent successors, so the results of actions. The goal test is a set of goal nodes. So it could so look something like this. If this was a 3 by 3 Pac-Man world, Eat all the dots, the state space graph that we get in our search problem could look like this. Um, note that it's actually continuing outside of the slides, it's just a small fraction of the state space graph. And for example, here we have the start state. From there, you can go to two possible successor states. And then note that you can also loop around it. Like, for example, you could be here, go back there, come back, keep going back and forth. But every possible state. <laughs> will appear only once in this graph. You have, don't have double appearances of the exact same configuration. Okay. So rarely can we build this state space graph up in memory, and we won't want to. We saw some examples kind of eat all the dots. If there is 100 dots, the state space graph will be containing 2 to the 100 states, which is very, very large at least, and maybe more because you're also encoding the location of Pac-Man and so forth. So, but nevertheless, conceptually, it's a good idea to know that this graph exists and we can reason about it, we can think about it. What would be happening if we were moving around in the state space graph? We're just not gonna actually build it and work with it when we write code. Now, for the purposes of these slides, we will wanna work with a state space graph that is completely unrealistic. You're never gonna care about a search problem this small, but just to illustrate concepts, we'll work often with this tiny, tiny, tiny state space graph. But keep in mind, when you see this, this is just an illustration. This is not representative of real state space graphs in terms of size. Another concept we're going to work with is search trees. A search tree is essentially something that builds the what if scenarios. So it starts with the start state. That's where you are right now. If they can look at the successor function and ask it, well, from the start state, what can I do? They'll say, well, from this state, you can do North, take the action north or east, there's a cost associated with that, end up in those two states. Those are possible futures after one action. Now you can again call the successor function, get possible futures after two actions, and so forth. The search tree is a what-if tree that essentially contains plans. For example, this spot in the search tree over here corresponds to the plan of taking one action from the start state, that is the action of going north. The start state will always be the root node, over here, children correspond to successors that result from taking actions. The nodes show states. So if you look at this, this looks like a state, but it's actually more than just a state. It has a history to it. You can see in the search tree where it came from. And so when we look at this point in the search tree, we really think of it as a plan that results from starting here and making our way there. And so it is possible that this exact same configuration appears somewhere else down here. And so there could be repeats in the search tree when you look at it, but it's actually something different because you went through a different sequence of actions to get to the same situation. The search tree actually will even be bigger typically than the state space graph. And so we'll typically have no chance of actually building up that tree. But if we could build up that tree, we could just check all the plans that sit in that tree and then pick one that achieves the goal and go with that. So let's look at an example. Here on the left, we have a state space graph, right? Just make sure we separate those concepts. State space graph is our tiny, tiny little graph that can fit on a slide. Um, here's the start state. And then here's a path that we might care about. And here's the corresponding search tree. So the way that's built up is we have start, start node and then successors from there, successors from there, and so forth. This node over here, G in red, this node corresponds to the path that comes through F, through R, through E, through D, from S, which is marked in red over here. 
Note that there's also a G sitting over here. Another way of getting to the goal state. That's fine. This is a search tree. It's enumerating all the possible scenarios that could play out, and some scenarios will have the same result, that you are at the goal state, but might take a different path to get there. A little quiz for you to think about. Here's a four-state graph, tiny, tiny little state space graph. Um, how big is the search tree when we start with the starting state S? All right, any thoughts? How big is the search tree? Somebody over there. So the answer was it's infinite because you have this cycle here, right? So infinitely large, it's correct. And how do you get the search tree? If you start building this up, you start at S, call the successor function, you get A and B. Then call the successor function again. From A, you would get to B and G. From B, you get to A and G. If you're actually running a search, you might say, hey, I, I saw a goal. Maybe I'm done with it. But if you're just building the search tree, you keep going. What else can be built up? From B, you could go to A and G. From A, you could go to B and G. And this can keep going on, in fact, forever and is an infinitely deep search tree. Okay? So even though the state space graph is only four nodes, search tree infinitely large. Okay. Now, there's, of course, a lot of repeated structure here, and we'll look at ways to manage that and not build up search trees where we repeat seeing the same thing many, many times. But the definition of the search tree will have everything in it that could play out. Let's start looking at the first algorithm. The name may be slightly unfortunate, but it's just uh, flipping the two words that we've been saying the most. It's tree search. Um, here's our example scenario again, the Romania map. And let's build up a search tree for this map. So this is Search tree start at a rod. I'm already so showing in green dotted what the search tree looks like, not the entire search tree, but the beginning of the search tree. But initially your search tree that you build up incrementally, and that'll be the game we'll be playing, build up your search tree incrementally, and hopefully you find a goal before you build up the whole thing. Actually, hopefully long before you build up the whole thing, you find a goal. So you start with a rod, call a successor function, you get successors, now you have three leaf nodes. The leaf nodes will call the fringe. From that fringe, we select one of them. We expand from there, and we kind of keep going, looking at the fringe. In this case, we have six leaf nodes in the fringe. Pick one of them, expand, and repeat. So let's look at that in pseudocode. So here's our tree search pseudocode. Tree search takes in a takes in a problem, that's a search problem, and then a strategy. We're not gonna worry about the strategy for now, we'll ignore that, but it takes in a search problem, and it's supposed to return a solution or a failure, namely that it can't find a solution. Initially, we set up the search tree using just the initial state of the problem. We call our search problems data structure, and we say, give us the initial state, start state. We put that as our starting point, and then we go through a loop where we keep building up the search tree, if there are no candidates for expansion, right, what would that mean? We have our current search tree. We look at all the leaf nodes, the fringe, essentially, and none of them can be expanded. So there is, none of them have successors. Then we're done, we return failure. There's no possibilities anymore that we haven't seen yet. Assuming there are leaf nodes available for expansion, then we, ex we pick one of them according to a strategy. That will be the magic sauce that defines the specific choice of algorithm. But for now, let's assume there's some strategy, somebody helps you pick one of those nodes that is in your fringe. If you check that node, remember that node is really a plan. It's not just a state, it's a plan from start state to getting to some current state. You check, is that current last state in that plan achieving the goal? If it is, you call it done, because you found the path to the goal, that's it, and you return that. If it's not the goal, you expand that node by calling the successor function, add its children, the search tree and you keep going around this cycle. Okay? Important ideas here, the fringe, it's the nodes that are available for expansion. 
There's the concept of expansion where you call your successor function on a specific current node and get it expanded into its successors. And there's an exploration strategy, which we haven't looked at yet, but which determines which node we're going to expand next. <coughs> so let's do this on an example. First example, our tiny, tiny little graph. We start in our start state. So that goes into our search tree. And I'll be building up two data structures in parallel here. What you see on the left is going to be the search tree. What you'll see on the right is just keeping track of the fringe. Because the fringe is really the critical thing in this search algorithm, and so we'll just keep track of that on the right. So we have the start state. What does the algorithm do? Well, that's the only thing in the fringe. We call it the successor function on S. We get a bunch of successors. That's what it looks like in the tree. In the fringe, what it looks like is we call the successor function on S so it gets taken out of the fringe, and we put its successors into it. Okay? Next, we have to pick one from the fringe. S, D, S, E, or S, P. Any choices? D? Okay, maybe we'll go with D. Sure. Let's go with D. We'll pick D. Expand D. We'll get its successors. What it looks like in the parallel data structure, you don't need both, but just to visualize both here, you can take the node S, D, take it out, call the successor function on the state D, get its successors, and then include these new nodes into the fringe. All right, what might we pick next for expansion? E, E is a good pick. Um, there's multiple E's to pick from. There is SE and there is SDE. Let's assume we pick SDE in this case, okay? Um, we expand, we get H and R underneath. On the fringe side, what it means is we get rid of that one, we used it and we enter its successors into the fringe. What might we pick now? R would be a natural choice. We call the successor function on R. We add its successors into the search tree. We do the same thing on the fringe side. Okay, getting pretty close to the goal. Let's call successor function on F this time. Expand. On the fringe, same thing happens. Take it out, add successors. What now? Well, we're not done yet. The way the algorithm is defined, we only declare success once we try to expand something and it actually already achieves the goal. So let's next pick the one that achieves G. Try to expand that. But before we do that, we check, did it already achieve the goal? It did, so we declare success. Okay. At this point we have success. What if we expanded just a small part of the search tree? The actual search tree is a lot bigger. So this is the complete search tree, but we only expanded this part. So this difference is kind of what our algorithm saved us from the most naive approach, which is building the entire search tree and then checking for a solution in there. The path we found is this path over here. Okay, so at this point we picked the strategy, but what we really want is a piece of code. We want a piece of code that tells us which node to pick next from the fringe for expansion. So let's take a break here, and after the break, let's start looking at strategies for expansion. <laughs> All right, let's restart. Um, any questions about the first half of lecture? No questions about the first half? Okay. Let's start looking at depth first search then. So. Depth first search is one way to run a tree search. So tree search is in some sense is our master algorithm, right? And it can be instantiated in multiple different ways. One way to instantiate the strategy of picking something from the fringe is a depth first strategy. So we're still running tree search. We're just running it in a depth first way now. What does that mean? I've already shown the entire search tree to you here on the slide corresponding to this state space graph. Start state S over here, goal state G over here. Initially, all that's in our incrementally built up search tree will be S. So S is highlighted there. When we call the successor function on S, we get three successor nodes. With a fringe of three, we have to make a choice. Which one are we going to expand first? Depth first says, says expand the deepest one first. They're all three equally deep. They're all after one action. So we have to break ties. 
In this case, we'll break ties alphabetically, so we'll expand D first. Okay? So expanding D gives us a fringe with, bless you, um, <laughs> gives us a fringe with B, C, E, E again, and P. So keep in mind, it's not that we really have E twice. These are search nodes. These are points in the search tree where it really encodes a plan of getting somewhere, not just the final state where you're in. Depth first, among those five, we'll say these three have highest priority because those are the deepest. They've taken two actions to get there. The other one's only one action. There's a three-way tie. We can arbitrarily break that tie here. It'll be depth first search no matter how we break ties between those. We'll break ties alphabetically, go with B first. Okay. Then we'll go deepest again. A is the deepest, so we'll pick A out of the fringe, expand. A has no successors, so nothing gets added to the fringe. What's deepest now? C and E on the left there. Tie breaking alphabetically, we pick C, expand. Now again, A is in there, is deepest. Pick A, call the successor function, no successors. So we continue. Now SDE is the deepest. We call the successor function on that. We get H and R. H and R are the deepest. Alphabetic tie breaking. H is next. We keep going through this process. What you see is a left to right traversal of the search tree until at some point what we expand is a, is a node that reaches the goal. At that point, we call it a success. And we return, in this case, S-D-E-R-F-G. That's what depth first search with alphabetical tie breaking will return to us for this problem. So it goes really deep, hopes to find a solution by going really deep. What are some properties of search algorithms that we can discuss? Now that we're going to have different um, strategies, we want to start comparing them and say, well, what property does this algorithm have versus that one? First thing we care about is completeness. Is an algorithm guaranteed to find a solution if one exists? Okay. Second property is optimality. Is an algorithm guaranteed to find the least cost path or just a path? Time complexity. How much running time is involved in it doing its work and then returning a solution, hopefully? Space complexity. How much memory do you need to run this algorithm? Here's a cartoon of a searcher that we'll be working with to illustrate these concepts. Now, this cartoon is extremely misleading from a kind of size point of view. Keep in mind, when you have a search tree, you start at the top. You have a bunch of successors, let's say a branching factor B, B successors. If that's typical, that's what we'll be working with to kind of illustrate the concepts. Some number, integer B. Okay. You go from one node to B nodes. The next layer, there will be B squared nodes. And next, next, there will be B to the third nodes and so forth. So this grows exponentially. How many nodes in a given tier is exponential in the depth? With at the bottom tier, B to the M nodes. In this cartoon drawing, the deeper you are, it just goes linearly with depth, which is very different. All right, so keep that in mind as you look at these trees that really they're exponentially growing, getting bigger and bigger very, very quickly as you go deeper. We'll call B the branching factor and M the maximum depth, meaning that there's nothing deeper that can be done in this tree. Sometimes that's infinity, that's possible. It could be solutions at various depths, so it could be that there's a solution maybe all the way at the maximum depth, but another one at a shallower depth. Maybe you might even prefer the shallower one, who knows? Um, the number of nodes in this tree is one plus B plus B squared and so forth, roughly order B to the M exponential in the branching fact. So exponential in the depth and the, the base is the branching factor. All right, let's look at a first algorithm, depth first search, and what the properties are. The question to ask ourselves is, how would depth first search traverse this search tree and where would it stop? We've seen it by example, we'll show this on this cartoon here. You kind of go left to right, depth first, and that's how you streak through this tree. And in this case, you'd probably stop right there because it's the first point where you'd encounter a goal state. Okay, so first question. We could process the entire tree, so running time could be pretty bad. If the depth is infinite, if, if depth is finite m, it would be a finite time, but if it's infinite, it could be infinite time. We have b to the m 
calculations that need to happen. B to the M nodes that could be expanded. When does this happen? This happens when your goal state would be sitting only here in that right bottom corner. So you'd have to struggle through the entire th tree before you finally see the goal state. So running time B to the M. How much space does it take when you're running? Any thoughts on that? What are you keeping around when you're running this, right? You're keeping around essentially your incremental search tree or your fringe, their equivalent, right? So the question is, what is sitting in your fringe at any given time when you're running depth first search? So let's look at that. Let's say you're working in this, in this tree. You're running your depth first search. Initially, you just have the start node in it. Then you'll expand. You'll have the start node gone, but then all these nodes in it. Right? Then you'll expand one of those, the left one first, but we want to see generically what will be sitting in the fringe, right? At some point we might expand someone in the middle here. This will lead to a bunch of successors below it. We'll have one of these expanded, which will have a bunch of successors below it that are sitting in the fringe, and this keeps going, right? So at every level, we'll have B nodes in the fringe, order B, and there can be M levels. So the amount that we have in memory will be order B times M, okay? So memory complexity is not too bad, not exponential. So we never store the entire tree, because once we've gone down a certain branch, we can discard it if we didn't find the goal, right? Is it complete? Is depth first search guaranteed to find a solution? I hear some yeses. It's kind of a guarded yes in some sense, in that if the search tree is infinitely large, it could be that it goes down some kind of left depth first path, so to say, that's infinitely deep, and there is no goal there, and it just keeps going, and it'll never return a solution. Okay? So something to be worried about, but if we are guarded about it and we make sure that it doesn't repeat visit states, which is something we'll look at in the future, that will fix that. But so that's the one thing to be careful about. If there are cycles, even if the state space is finite, it could go keep going down a cycle forever. If there are no cycles or you don't allow them during your search, it'll be complete. Is it optimal? Does it find the best path to a goal state? I hear some people laughing, uh, no. Um, it just finds the leftmost solution. It's pretty arbitrary. It's unlikely that the leftmost solution is really going to be the best solution. Okay, so that's one strategy. Next strategy, breadth first. Let's look at breadth first in action. Same cartoon as we had before. Our little state space graph, search tree shown over here, and we're going to highlight how breadth first search expands nodes to build up part of that search tree, but hopefully not the entire search tree. So initially, just the start state. Fringe has only one, one node in it. That's the one you're going to expand. Okay. Now there are three nodes in it. Breadth first wants the most shallow one first, but they're all one action away from the start node, so they're equally shallow. So we'll break ties alphabetically again. So D first. Now we have a fringe with three nodes over here, two over here. Breadth first goes with the shallowest ones first, which means E and P over here. Alphabetically breaking ties, it'll go with SE first, expand over there. Next up, SP. And we continue that way, and we see that it kind of streaks layer by layer through the search tree. And when it hits a layer, where somewhere in that layer there's a goal, a goal state that gets achieved, it'll be able to return with success. It'll be done. So I'll only have to go as deep in that search tree as wherever the first goal state appears. So I'll find the goal state that takes the least actions to get to. Okay, let's look at some properties. Which ones does it expand? We saw in the cartoon, it kind of goes top down, so it kind of goes layer by layer by layer. Um, shallowest, it finds a shallow solution. How many nodes does it exp expand? What's the computational complexity? Well, if you go to the shallowest solution, the way it does this, you expand every node until you get there. Let's define a new variable, S, which is how deep the shallowest solution is sitting. Then we have B, which is the branching factor, to the power 
S nodes that end up getting expanded to find the solution. Okay? So B to the S computational complexity. How about space? How big does the fringe get running breadth first search? Any thoughts? So what is being kept on the fringe while you're running this? In this case, you're streaking through layer by layer. So it's always, in some sense, the last layer will be what's on the fringe and still part of the layer above it that hasn't been expanded yet. So roughly the size of one layer, maybe two layers, depending on how you count. And so the complexity is the size of the biggest layer that you ever considered. So if you have to go up to depth S, the memory complexity is B to the S, which corresponds to the number of nodes that is on the fringe in a given layer at any time. So exponential space complexity. Is it complete? Is it guaranteed to find a solution if one exists? Yes, right? It'll just keep going, keep going layer by layer, and wherever is the shallowest solution, it'll return that. Is it optimal? Kind of yes and no. It depends how you define optimal. If you define the cost to be one for every action, then it's optimal. But if actions might have varying costs, it's just minimizing the number of actions it takes to get to a goal. So it might not be optimal in terms of the cost sense, but it is optimal relative to finding a sequence of actions that's shortest to get to a goal state. All right, so a little quiz here in terms of let's give all of you um, 30 seconds to talk to your neighbors about the following two questions. When will BFS, breadth first search, outperform depth first search, and when will it be the other way around? Um, discuss with your neighbors and we'll see what you come up with. see what you've got. Um, anybody with an answer to the first question, when might BFS be preferred over DFS? Any thoughts? Over there. So when what we care about most is number of actions to get to the goal because it's guaranteed to find such a, such a solution, right? Any other reasons you might prefer it? Over there? So if depth first search might go really, really deep, but there's actually a, maybe a, a shallow solution and then breadth first will never go deeper than the most shallow solution. So running time-wise, it might be a good thing because you, you don't end up going that deep. So those are two of the main advantages. Um, any advantages to depth first search? Over there. Okay, so one suggestion there is in some sense, what if the solutions are all up at the bottom, let's say, and they're all equally deep, and they're all the way at the bottom of your search tree, right? Then depth first will kind of go through that bottom very quickly, go check things out there, whereas breadth first will only at the very end start looking at that last layer and then finally start seeing solutions. So that's a good example, actually. We'll see search problems of that type when we look at constraint satisfaction problem solving. So we'll see some good examples of that. Another suggestion here? Limited resources. So memory complexity, right? Exponential in the depth of the shallowest solution for breadth first, but linear in the depth and the branching factor for depth first. So when you run a breadth first search, it's quite likely you'll run out of memory um, for large problems. Depth first will not run out of memory. 
So that's a really important consideration. First thing I say, let, let's take a look at what, it, let's look at some demos and then let's start thinking about how we can get the best of both algorithms in one algorithm. So first demo here, let's see. Demo number six. Um, okay, what are we looking at here? Start state in green, goal state in red. This is a maze to navigate. Black are walls, you cannot go through the walls. Blue is where you can be. Now we're gonna look at um, different search algorithms and see how they behave. So the little quiz here, I'm gonna press a button on my keyboard. That button press will engage a search algorithm. You will see that search algorithm in action. The way you'll see it in action is you'll see dots pop up that indicate that that state has been expanded. The successor function has been called on that state. So you'll see where the successor function has been active. And essentially that tells you how the search tree is being built up, right? And I'll keep doing that until it finds a path to the goal, at which point, hopefully it's clear. You just kind of, no need for 30 seconds of discussion here. Just shout it out, whatever you think it is. And hopefully the, what comes out of kind of the average or max of what you shout is the right thing. Um, first one, let's take a look. So I'm hearing bread first. Why? How do you see this as bread first? Well, let's look at it again. It's radiating out from where it starts. So it's looking at ones that are only one step away, then only two steps away, three steps away, and so forth. All right, let's look at another one. <laughs> Dead first search finds that left depth first solution for us. A uh, very different kind of exploration pattern than uh, breadth first. Let's look at it again just so you can remember how this plays out. All right, so breadth first and depth first, very different behaviors. Um, pros and cons to each one of them. Let's start thinking about how we can get the best of both worlds. So what can we do to get in some sense the efficiency of breadth first of not going too deep, but then also the memory efficiency, efficiency of depth first of not having this huge fringe that's exponential in the depth that we're currently at. Something called iterative deepening. And so what does it do? Look at our search tree. What it'll do, it'll say, I'm gonna run depth first search because that's the only thing I can run without potentially running out of memory between the two. So I have to run depth first search to not run out of memory. But to avoid going off the deep end, we're going to run depth first search but not allow it to go deeper than a depth of one. So when you're at a depth of one, you cannot expand anymore from that node. You run your depth first search. If it returns a solution, it'll be a solution that's a depth one. It will not have gone deeper than that. If it doesn't return a solution, we now change that parameter. We say we'll run depth first search again. You can only go up to depth two. So you cannot expand beyond depth two. If there's a solution at depth two, it'll find that, return it. And we repeat this over and over, increasing the depth to which we're willing to go. So this has this kind of streaking behavior like breadth first search. It's a little different in that it runs a depth first search up to that depth. The advantage, memory. It only has a small fringe because depth first search keep around a relatively small fringe. The slight downside is you do some repeat work. Because when you search for depth k plus one, you kind of redo all the work you did for depth k. Why do we still like this scheme? Because the work you do for the last layer dominates all the work you did before because of the exponential growth as a function of the depth, the tree grows so quickly. And so what you did at shallower depths is essentially negligible compared to what you're doing at the last depth. And so that's why this works out quite well, running time-wise and um, memory-wise. So that's what you'd want to do rather than breadth-first or depth-first if otherwise you'd run out of memory or run out of time. Okay. Depth first and breadth first completely ignore the cost of actions. Now here we have a graph where on each of the edges there is a cost. It's a cost of three to go from star to D. It's a cost of one to go to P. It's a cost of two to go from D to E and so forth. And we might be interested in finding a path that is least cost. Algorithm, first algorithm we'll see for that is called uniform cost search. Some of these names are unfortunate. 
Um, but they're the, the names everybody uses, so we're sticking with those names. But uniform cost search does not mean that the costs are uniform for all actions. It means the algorithm that we're about to cover, which is exactly targeting the case where the costs are not uniform. Um, so <laughs> here's our graph again now with costs annotated on the edges. Okay, we build up our search tree. Start with just S, expand S, we get D, E, and P. We have costs for getting to D, to E, to P. Uniform cost search picks the one with the least costs first. So that would be P, expand P first. Now we have on the fringe D, E, and Q. D has the least cost, expand that one. Now we have on our fringe B, C, E, E, and Q. B is the lowest cost, expand B first. Now E is lowest cost, the E that's sitting here below D is the one that has lowest cost. Expand that one first, and we keep going. By cost incurred so far, streaking through this search tree, incrementally building it up according to how much cost it takes to get to a certain node in that tree. It's a lot like breadth first search. Just breadth first went layer by layer, and now essentially we go by ISO contours of cost encountered so far. So what nodes do we expand when we run uniform cost search? Well, it's a lot like breadth first search. Whenever you find the goal with the least cost, that's what you're going to return, right, in this kind of search. So you're going to be searching until you finally found a goal with least cost, right? And so what does that mean? Well, you're streaking through this until you finally encounter a goal that is the least cost goal. To be able to say how many nodes we expanded, we need to introduce a little bit of terminology, but conceptually it's all nodes that have a cost less than the cheapest goal node will be expanded. That's the intuition. Mathematically, if we define C star to denote the optimal cost that you can achieve to get to a goal, then you'll expand every node with cost less than C star. Okay? Now, if each action costs at least epsilon, then it means that you'll have expanded chains of at most C star over epsilon long, right? Because any sequence of actions that's more actions than C star over epsilon would accumulate more than C star cost, and we don't do that. We only go up to C star. So we have a depth, essentially, of C star over epsilon. And so the number of nodes expanded would be branching factor to the power C star over epsilon. All right, how much space does the fringe take? Well, it's a lot like breadth first search, right? You're essentially keeping, in the worst case, you essentially keep everything around that's lower cost than this and at some point. And so you have order B to the C star over epsilon in your fringe, which corresponds to what the last tier of nodes would correspond to. Is it complete? Is it guaranteed to find a solution if one exists? Yes, right, because it just keeps going layer by layer. It's not going to get sidetracked in some infinitely uh, costly path because it has to keep costs finite. Um, so the assumption here is that there's some finite cost for every action, right? If it were zero cost for some actions, in principle, it could cycle through zero cost actions forever. Um, but in practice, there are no actions that we'll consider to have zero cost. Is it optimal? Yes, it's optimal. Why? Because it keeps working on its fringe, pulling the lowest cost node, pulling the lowest cost node, and it'll only declare success when the lowest cost node that it pulled was indeed the goal node, achieving the goal, right? What that means at that point, when it pulled that node and it saw the cheapest cost node achieves the goal, everything else on the fringe that is still available as other options is already more expensive to get to than we have right now in terms of getting to the goal. There's no way you could expand that in something cheaper to get to the goal. So once you get the goal as the cheapest node on your fringe and you pull it out because it's the cheapest node, at that point, you are done. And you have the optimal path to the goal. We'll see a more formal proof next lecture where we'll look at A star and this will be a special case of that. What are some issues? Okay, it's nice that it kind of explores in terms of increasing cost. Um, so that's good, it's complete and optimal. The bad, it kind of goes in every direction has no notion of where the goal might be. That's something we'll start fixing next lecture. Let's take a look at what I mean with having no notion of where the goal 
might be. So here is a demo of uniform cost search in action. Same kind of grid, no walls. Start at the green dot, need to get to red. Uniform cost search, what does it do? Well, here's how it explores that space. And so it goes in all directions equally far if the cost is equal, like breadth first search. And so it might expand a lot of things that are not really bringing it close to the goal. So that's something we'll start fixing next time. All right, we've seen this. Now let's look at a few different algorithms in action. Bless you. We will quiz you on which algorithm you are seeing in action. So I will press a button. That button press will determine what, a, what algorithm is being run. We still have black being walls. You can't traverse the walls. There is shallow water, which is the lighter blue. There is deep water, which is the darker blue. It's more costly to move through the deep water. It's less costly to move through the shallow water. So you can imagine that the best path will mostly be through the shallow water, but, or maybe entirely even through the shallow water, depending on exactly how this plays out. Okay? So I'll pick one algorithm to run out of uniform cost search, breadth first search, and depth first search, and you'll try to determine which one it is. All right. Here we go, first one. Breadth first search, why? Let's look at it again. It expands equally along all directions, ignoring the fact that something might be deeper water, which is more costly, or less deep water, which is less costly. Next one. Uniform cost search, why? It expands more quickly along the shallow water paths. So specifically look Look over here how the expansion over here goes faster than over here. So let's look at this again. You'll see that over there it expands more quickly than in the deep water. All right, another one. <laughs> I think we all know which one that is. Depth first search, trying hard. Um, Okay, here's one really important thing that I want to get across about all of these algorithms. I presented to you something called tree search. This was one algorithm that actually is a master algorithm for depth first, depth first, breadth first, and uniform cost. And the only thing you change is what you pick from the fringe. That's the only thing you change. So if your fringe is implemented as a priority queue, then depth first is just priority corresponds to how deep you are, deeper is better. Breadth first is priority corresponds to how shallow you are. Shallower is better. And uniform costs then mean, just means priority corresponds to how much cost it takes to get to a certain point. And whichever has the least cost has the highest priority comes out first. Okay, so you can implement all of these with one implementation, just a different priority function if you want to. It's easy when you are in a class like this to get really intrigued and maybe rightfully so by the algorithms. It turns out that in practice, these algorithms will often already exist for you. You'll implement them in this class, but in the real world, you'll go out and these algorithms will exist. And what will be really important is to pay attention to the models you use, what we looked at at the beginning of class. And to realize that these models are never perfect and that often when things don't work in the real world, it's not because you have a bug in your depth first search or your breadth first search, it's because your model just isn't the right model. So here are some examples of search gone wrong. First example, MapQuest. This is something um, where people would find paths to go somewhere. This is the path it suggests. If you actually try to drive that path, you'll encounter this little alleyway here where a car just couldn't go. <laughs> Why does that happen? The model of the real world just isn't realistic. You have a wrong model, you find the wrong solution. The algorithm they run was probably fine, just the model, the search, formulation was not right. Here's another one. Trying to go a pretty small distance in Norway. Um, <laughs> but it turns out the state space graph from this starting point over here only had as a successor to get on the ferry. There was no other successor. You could get on the ferry, that was it, and then you're off to Scotland and all the way back <laughs> to get out back in Norway. So search can go really wrong. If your models are wrong, keep that in mind. All right, see you next lecture. <laughs>